All right. Hi. Good morning, everybody, and Happy New Year. Um, welcome to our first webinar this year on Managed Futures 2022 Unwrapped and uh, Remixing Classic Portfolios. So for the next hour, we will provide you with an overview of what happened in 2022, how KMLM was positioned, and uh, what drove its outperformance. More importantly, though, we will turn our attention to the future. Uh, we will discuss how managed futures can still prove to be a great tool to add to any portfolios. Um, and uh, we will show you some great examples as well. Um, my name is Snowy Ding. I am a senior investment strategist here at uh, Queen Shares. Uh, before introducing to our great speaker today, I, let me just share some housekeeping items with you. We're streaming this event live both on our website as well as on Zoom. So if you are streaming online and have some questions, please submit them to info at queenshares.com. That's info at queenshares.com. If you're on Zoom, then you can just submit the questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We're looking forward to a very lively Q&A session at the, at the end of the presentation. So please don't hesitate to ask your questions as they occur to you. If you do wish to apply for SEMA or CFP credit, then please remember to email CE, that stands for continuing education at queenshares.com. I uh, just want to share a little bit about us. Queen Funds Advisors was established in 2013 and is the investment manager for Crane Shares and KFA Funds ETFs. We're probably best known for our China-focused ETFs, uh, which includes Crane Shares CSI China Internet ETF, uh, which is uh, ticker symbol is KWeb. And now we also manage the Crane Shares Global Carbon ETF, KRBN, that's part of our carbon climate investing suite. That's also become a core pillar of our investing uh, firm's offerings. However, today we're focusing on our KFA Mount Lucas index strategy, which is KMLM. That's part of our KFA funds. So um, KFA funds are differentiated high conviction investment strategies that's offering groundbreaking capital market opportunities. And we're often leveraging the specialized expertise of our partners, such as Mount Lucas. So I'm very delighted to be joined today by Jerry Pryor, the COO, Senior Portfolio Manager, and Managing Partner at Mount Lucas Management. So Jerry has been with Mount Lucas since 1987, pretty much from the very start of Mount Lucas, actually. Um, he has served as Portfolio Manager for the firm's MLM index, symmetry funds, and custom quantitative managed funds. So Mount Lucas was started um, back in 1986, and it provides innovative alternative investment strategies to institutional and high net worth investors. The firm first launched the MLM index back in 1998 as the first alternative beta index, and investors can now access this index through our KMLM ETF, that is the focus of our discussion today. So Jerry, um, I think you're going to start us off today with a very interesting graph you found. Sure, uh, well, a couple slides ahead. Thanks, Snowy. Uh, happy New Year and Happy New Year to everybody on the call. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we got a, you know, a lot of interesting things to talk about today, and you know, I think. You know, as everybody is doing at this time of year, is looking back on 22 and uh, seeing what worked and what didn't work. Uh, this is an interesting chart uh, we came across in the FT. Uh, it, it looked it, it's a scatter plot of stock and bond returns uh, every year uh, since 1871, and you can see on this chart, 22 uh, was quite the outlier. Uh, that glaring that, red dot in that left bottom quadrant is not looking happy. <laughs> no, no. And, and, and I think a lot of people are sitting there going, why wasn't I prepared for 2022? Well, I, you know, you have to think, uh, you know, over a century of conditioning to returns where, you know, typically when stocks go down, this is the upper left quadrant, uh, bonds are up, mm -hmm. or if stocks are up in the upper right quadrant, quadrant bonds are up and even in those uh even you know in, sometimes bonds are down when stocks are up but you really never see bonds and stocks down uh in the same year there's really only two other occurrences on this graph in 1941 and 1969 
so, so it's no shock that the investing world wasn't uh, particularly prepared for this kind of environment. And, you know, I think as, as Snowy alluded to, this, this was, uh, you know, quite a good year for the managed future space, uh, for our fund in particular, as well as, well as you know, other, uh, you know, most of the managers in the space. This was, 22 was a good year. And, you know, managed futures isn't something that's uh, new to, the, to this world. It's been around for about 40 years. Uh, you know, it's often been thrown to the curb uh, by, with, fr with frustrated uh, uh, in, in investors uh, for periods, uh, you know, of trailing returns or, uh, you know, not great returns. Uh, but what managed futures has always sort of done is delivered in those periods of high stress. And, you know, and I, I will talk a little bit more as, as we go along about, you know, understanding what drives managed futures returns, where the investor premium is and what, and why they tend to work in those periods of stress. And, you know, you know, we, we've been running an index that we created it since in 1988. Uh, it's not a, uh, very complicated index. It's a, you know it's it's a simple moving average. It's not optimized by market. We take long we look at long term uh, uh, signals. Uh, it's pure trend. We let we let our renter, winners run. We don't we don't sell uh, we don't use sort of volatility to you know sell out of uh, winning positions early. Uh, you know in and ultimately we're looking to what pure trend gets you is it, it gets you the sort of the the full right tail uh, in those uh, in those stress events. So uh, again, good year for managed futures. Uh, you know, it's really an outlier year for stocks and bonds. Uh, and, you know, and I think let's uh, let's talk about uh, what's going on a little bit. Uh, yeah, so I'm curious to see that, right? Because KMLM part of the thesis should be in a year of stress like 2022. It it should be working and. Um, Curious to see what kind of risk premiums managed futures should be able to capture in 2022, but also curious to see in different time periods how it how it how it works. Yeah, I mean that's a, that's a great point. So because ultimately, uh, you know, managed futures is used in a portfolio uh, as a diversifying instrument. It's uh, and for you to have managed futures in the portfolio as part of your asset allocation. You really have to understand where the risk premiums come from uh, as an investor, so that you know, because you have to live with this asset class uh, through good times and bads, so just like you live through stocks and bonds through good times and bad. You have to understand. You have to understand why it's working uh, when it's working and why it's not working when it's not working. Uh, I think the 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 main point, you know, for the last 30, 40 years of this firm, uh, you know, we always try to drive drive home the point that there is a risk premium to investors in the futures markets. Uh, and, and it's one that can be understood. Uh, and that risk premium comes from the fact that futures markets exist to transfer price risk uh, away, away from uh, consumers and producers, uh, businesses that face, those, that face uh, changes in prices as a business risk to the firm. So what they're trying to do is get rid of get rid of that price risk. And where we step in as managed futures investors is we are accepting that price risk uh, from, those, from those businesses. And ultimately, uh, the way we access that is, is through uh, systematic trend following. So it's quantitative models uh, that look to profit off large price moves uh, in either up or down. Uh, so if you think about that's particularly the risk that businesses are trying to get rid of is those large price moves up or down that would uh, materially affect their margins. We're ex we accepting those. We're consistently putting on positions uh, that will profit in, in a big move, uh, either, up, either up or down. Uh, I think one thing I like to you know, when we, we start thinking about trend following and you think about these quantitative models, it's never, you know, we never judge our index or our model uh, based on one position or one trade. You have to look at it over, a, you know, in order to capture that risk premium, it's a, 
it's a statistical premium that that you get by doing a thousand trades across many markets over over periods of time. Um, but that being said, there are environments that are more conducive to uh, to, to manage futures. Uh, you know, one way we looking at it in this slide is across uh, decades. Uh, in this, the start date on this is when when our index was created in 1988, uh, and it goes through uh, today. So we look at sort of the annualized return uh, of managed futures. So that's this is sort of the top three rows. Uh, it's volatility uh, and correlation to a 60/40 portfolio. Then we look at bonds uh, in the middle and in st stocks uh, on the bottom, and then the 60/40 all the way at the bottom. But I think what you see here is in the 80s, 90s, to, and, and starting to dwindle down in the 2000s a little bit. Uh, you know, it, I think the key row to look at is the volatility row, uh, where managed futures was running at a really high vol uh, in the late 80s uh, and decently high vol volatility in the 90s and 2000s. Then, it, without really any change whatsoever, drops precipitously. Uh, in two, between 2010 and 2019. And, and you see that drop in volatility uh, in bonds uh, as well, going from you know, sort of that five to 3.9 and down to 2.9 in the 2010s. And you see it in stocks going from you know, in the 2000s, running at 16 vol uh, and dropping down to 12. And same with the in, in 60, 40, it's just the stock bond combination. So that drops as well. Uh, so what you had in that environment was, you know, sort of globalization, uh, a, a Fed put on the stock, stock market. Uh, you had a lot of selling of volatility going on in hedge funds and, and different asset classes. Uh, you know, basically, post-financial crisis, there was so much quantitative easing, there's so much money going in, and there's so much support uh, to markets that it quashed uh, or squashed. Uh, volatility across the board. And now what happens is you have sort of more stable asset classes, more stable prices, you know, and that risk premium uh, in managed futures, which depends on sort of price instability, not stability. Uh, we, we saw that that was, a, that was a poor environment for trend following. We had very stable prices, stable interest rates, stable interest rates uh, led to stable currencies. Uh, not a lot of price movement, large price movements up or down, uh, sort of in any of the asset classes. So, uh, so when we look at the returns to manage futures in that in that time period, and we also think about, uh, you know, a lot of managers or uh, you know advisors that have gotten frustrated with managed futures uh, during that time period. Uh, you know, the reason was the risk premium wasn't there, and, and the returns reflected that. Uh, so far this decade, uh, we've you know, clearly had some sort of momentous events between the pandemic uh, and the Ukraine war, inflation, rising rates, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, we've seen the volatility in managed futures pop back up. We've seen the volatility in bonds pop back up to uh, you know, volatility not seen since the 80s. Uh, it, same with stock volatility. Volatility is sort of up across the board, we're, you know, in my mind, we're seeing an environment uh, that's much more conducive to managed futures returns uh, than we saw in the in the last decade. So, for those yeah. that had a poor experience uh, in the last decade, uh, what we're seeing so far this decade, and then also in 22, uh, it has been uh, good good so far. Yeah. Speaking of the last decade, we actually have a question that just came through talking specifically about that. So um, username uh, Magna March come asking why the terrible 2010 to 19 performance, specifically talk, what you were just talking about, if the strategy is to follow price trends, how did it miss the S&P 500 trend in that decade? Sure, so one thing uh, this index does, does not have an investment in is equities. Uh, and the reason being, uh, so it did miss it because we weren't invested in it in this fund. The, the reason we don't have it, uh, and it's not that trend following equities doesn't work. Uh, we believe it does. Uh, our view, longstanding view, is that you don't want equities uh, in something in a managed futures product like this 
because you're using it as a diversifier to uh, the equities and bonds that you already own. So if, if we add equities in, uh, our return may have been a little bit better in that period, but it would be less diversifying in the current period because uh, you know having equities in there sort of either adds to your risk uh, the, in, in the equity portfolio that you already own. Um, so we, in, our, in our view, equities muddies the water in a product like this. And, and what we primarily see the use of this product is as a diversifier. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So we are sorry. That that was a great question to have. I think we we see that a lot from advisors too. Uh, they use this as a diversifier because again, um, a lot of the advisors already have uh, either a sixty forty or some kind of um, divert portfolio already that they are long equities um, in their existing portfolio too. So that would be kind of redundant in a way. Absolutely. Um, so looking at this performance, I think we've talked to some managers, uh, a lot of them would like to kind of forget 2022 happened, right, looking at the performance, I think we're in the minority, 36.7% is pretty impressive, especially compared to S&P and what, what else out there. Um, from investors' perspective, um, looking at this, I think the first question they would ask would be, are we... Are we too late to the party now? Is this is the rally is this the rally down? Are we buying at a high? Is is it too late to get in at this point? Yeah, I mean that's that's a great question, and, it, and we have this chart in the deck here, uh, you know, to address that. Uh, what you're seeing here in this chart, I think, it is interesting. Is we've if we've looked to so going back to 1988, we looked at the trailing 12 month return uh, of the KFA MLM index. Uh, and then we separated all of those trailing 12 month returns into quintiles. So you could see, you know, there's 80 observations in, in the weakest quintile, uh, something around so I can see 80 observations in the strongest quintile. So. Uh, so in the weakest quintile, we have trailing 12 month returns somewhere between minus 22 and minus four. Uh, and then what we do is we look at the, the forward 12 month uh, return and take, the, and take the average of those. So uh, in those 80 observations that were between negative 22 and minus four, the average 12 month forward return was 6.4. Uh, the same goes for in this, in the, the next quintile, uh, which had trailing 12 month returns between minus four and plus 4.6, the forward 12 month return averaged uh, 11.6. Uh, and then in the strongest uh, quintile, uh, you know, with trailing 12 month returns between 25 and 56, that's about where we were when we finished the year, was it, it, we would have been in that strongest quintile. The forward returns. Uh, over the next 12 months, uh, on average, we're 9.3. So, you know, we put this in here a little bit, this, you know, uh, to speak to the, the idea of timing managed futures. And, you know, if you can you sell the top or, you know, or do you need to wait for a period of bad performance to get in? Uh, there's, there's not a lot of predictive information here other than that, it, you know, in, in, in our minds, we, you know, managed futures should be in there as sort of a, a, a standing asset allocation. Uh, the way returns are in managed futures because they're positively skewed, because they're episodic in nature, you sort of have to have it on all the time uh, in order to, uh, to, to get those uh, sort of episodic events, those periods of stress tend to be driven in the markets, tend to be driven by exogenous factors that are oftentimes unpredictable. Uh, so if you want access to things like that, um, you know, you, you sort of have to always uh, have this on. And I think this chart gives some comfort to the idea that, uh, you know, even though you've had a, a series of strong returns, uh, you might, you might, uh, you know, there is an expectation that the next 12 months, uh, you know, sort of acts on its own. And, uh, you know, a lot of times, Volatility begets more volatility, and you know, again, going back to the previous slide, uh, so far we're seeing higher volatility markets, which is typically a, 
a tailwind uh, for managed features. Yeah, and I think to speak to that, right, on the next slide, we'll see it's it always is good to have this in times of crisis of unpredictability. And the nature of that is we never really know what's going to happen. Right. And I think if you've listened to Jerry before, this slide is probably not new to you. Um, how KMLM, how Managed Futures reacts to these um, extraordinary events, um, global crisis, obviously, but more closely uh, coronavirus to the Ukraine war. Um, if you want to speak a little bit about that and how KMLM was positioned during this time period. Sure. Uh, I mean, just to recap on the 2008 uh, global financial crisis, uh, we entered that period, uh, you know, sort of a third quarter of 08, around September of 08. Uh, we were short commodities, long uh, bonds and long the dollar. Uh, you know, again, these are sort of these, uh, ep you know, episodic, uh, you know, you know, crash type of events or crisis type of events where, where the resulting flows. And so even though we're not equity investors, the resulting flows uh, fr from an equity event that happened in 08, uh, you know, it's affected what uh, the commodity markets, FX markets and uh, bond markets. Uh, in that period of stress, uh, being long bonds and long the dollar and short, particularly short commodities during that period, uh, was it was of extreme benefit to uh, diversify against uh, equities in that period. Uh, anytime, you know, and what these type of charts tell me with managed futures, and and, and this is something I'm, I, I tell every every uh, client I talk to, is these these are rebalancing moments. Uh, we, if you have managed futures in your portfolio, it's uh, it's a good idea to practice regular uh, rebalancing. Uh, right there, right there in March of 09, uh, you want to be, you know, if you're doing, if you're doing things quarterly or monthly or quarterly, even, or even semi-annually, you should be set, you should be selling managed futures uh, on the way up, you should be buying more stocks on the way down. Uh, but one thing managed futures gave you in, in, in that OA period in, in the portfolio was a, was a smoother ride. Um, and depending on how much you had in your portfolio, it allowed, it allowed you to hang on to that equity position at the low and not get stopped out or, or not get panicked out. Uh, corona, uh, coronavirus, inflation, Ukraine war, so basically everything since January 2020, uh, it's been a lot of very interesting moves. You see very uh, negatively correlated early uh, in this series, uh, and then late again, negatively correlated late, uh, and then positively correlated uh, in, in that middle period. Um, you know, we came into the pandemic. Uh, you know, and I'll show you on the uh, on the next slide in a second. Uh, you know, we got short commodities pretty quick. We got uh, and we and we came in long uh, bonds and got long the dollar pretty quick, and had real good diversification in what was really uh, an exogenous event that happened very very quickly. Uh, so. You, did not have a lot of time to react to that event. Uh, we, given the amount of monetary policy and, and uh, uh, fiscal policy that was pumped into the markets, you know, off the bottom in that pandemic, uh, markets reversed pretty quickly. Uh, we gave back a, a lot of the gains uh, that we had in that period, but again, a smoother ride in that period, sort of allowing you to hold your asset allocation uh, through that period and, and, and hopefully rebalanced along the way. Uh, that following period where we were somewhat uh, correlated to markets was a sort of a reflationary period, sort of driven by the fiscal and monetary easing. Uh, and then, we, you know, and then what happened in 22 was pretty interesting. And I'm going to show you some, some exposure charts, uh, you know, starting with the commodities. Uh, again, over on the left hand side with the commodities, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I'll move it around anyway. Uh, this first, this first part uh, on, on the left-hand side of it, that net exposure to commodities, you see where we got short uh, commodities really quick in 2020, and we're short. And then that, as we sort of ended that reflationary period, we got long commodities and we're long commodities uh, for quite some time, uh, and we're definitely uh, very long commodities going into 22, which 
through the about April, May timeframe uh, was a big driver of returns in managed futures uh, this year. Uh, the commodity markets have since sold off, uh, you know, quite, quite a bit. Ha haven't heard returns, uh, you know, have been detracted from returns, but it haven't been uh, from a from an attribution standpoint, it, ha it hasn't been terrible that, that sell off. Uh, again, here's the, do here's the dollar markets in 20. Uh, you see being short, this is being short foreign currency. So this is what when, when we're negative, we're actually long the dollar, if, uh, if that makes sense to you. Uh, so long, long, long the dollar and right in the heart of that pandemic as, as you'd expect is, is that would sort of be that flight to safety type trade. Uh, but then flip back in that reflationary period, uh, back short the dollar. And then for 22, uh, you know, even prior to 22, uh, back fully long the dollar here in this period. And for the most part, I'd say in the second half of the year, that, that trade, that long dollar trade, um, second, I would say second and third quarter did really, really well. Probably. Probably the best trend following uh, currency is done in a, in a long time uh, in the second and third quarter of this year. Um, the fourth quarter, a little bit different. Uh, and, and lastly, here on the bonds, uh, again, going in the pandemic, got really long bonds really quick. Uh, flight to safety, uh, as you'd expect. Here's a sort of as we entered that reflationary period, got short bonds, got stopped out of it a couple of times. But then got pretty short bonds almost right away in 22 uh, and been short pretty much ever since. Um, that's been that like in that second and third quarter period, uh, that trade did uh, extraordinarily well, uh, particularly in the sense that uh, trend following bonds, uh, we don't, in the last 40 years, we haven't spent that much time short bonds. Uh, you know, this is, this, but when we needed to be short bonds, we were short bonds uh, in, in that type of environment. Yeah, being able to long, to play both long short of the market is so important. Yeah, too. yeah and, and I mean, that's the big thing. That's the big thing about managed futures is you're getting both sides of the distribution, you're not just the long side, not just the short side. Uh, yeah. You get both sides of the distribution. It allows us, uh, Type of strategy to to, to change its exposures uh, to to the you know sort of the current market events. Again, we're long term in nature. We don't get there right away. Uh, we need sort of sort of big extended moves. Uh, but the the, the trade off being long term is that we don't get stopped out uh, and and whipsawed around quite so much. So. Uh, in our experience or long history, the long the, the longer term look, the long you know. Again, we're trend following. We follow what the markets are doing. We follow what the macro environments are doing. Uh, you know, it, it works and adapts over time uh, to, to different uh, market environments. By the way, I'm seeing some really great questions coming through as well. If we don't get to the questions now, we'll be sure to address them later. But I'm seeing something that is in line with what I was just about to ask Jerry. So Jerry, I will, I will tie it in as well. Someone just asked, I purchased KMLM in October, 2022, and I'm down 23% why? And that's something I was about to ask you too, because I think in Q4, we did see manage, managed futures give back some of its gains. Um, what kind of caused that? Sure. Uh, so we talked a little bit about the attribution there. And the, so this is this, uh, I, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but. Uh, you know this this sell off here off the sort of top of a uh, trend performance. So I, I would say the trend following or, or our index or our fund sort of peaked out there at the end, early October. I would say uh, the the big moves. Uh, I, re I wish I had some market charts here to show you, but the big moves in the fourth quarter, sort of post September thirty, um, well going into Sep Sep thirty. Uh, was the last sort of washout uh, in the in the currency and bond markets in the short bond market, more so on the currency side, and it, and that was driven by the, the sort of the Liz Trust UK tax debacle, uh, that tax plan that sent uh, 
um, British British pounds, uh, you know, you know, fell a ton. Uh, the the long gilt market, which is their, is the UK bond, uh, that sold off uh, during that period pretty dramatically, and, and those those were all bent beneficial to the MLM index that was short both pounds and uh, gilts during, during that period. Sort of post the, the end of the third quarter there, Liz Trust uh, ultimately resigned. The tax package never happened and, and went away. Uh, and that sort of last leg down and pounds and, and, and gilt unwound. Uh, so, so, those gain, so we gave back those gains. And then the second sort of major thing that happened in the fourth quarter was the, the, the Fed, uh, you know, sort of took its foot off the off the hawkish pedal ever so slightly. Uh, that uh, that reversed uh, some of the. I believe you might see some of that. You, you can see some of that uh, in sort of the dollar positioning here uh, at the far at the far right. Uh, you could see, you know, we were long, you know, again, short here, short position here means we're short the foreign currency, long the dollar. You see us starting to reduce reduce that into the end of the year. Uh, so what what happens when when the Fed gets a little bit more dovish, the dollar the dollar weakens uh, relative to other foreign currencies that are still uh, whose central banks are still pretty hawkish. Uh, that has gone so the, so it's sort of the sort of the end of the downtrend in in those currency markets uh, we've given back some of the gains that's to be expected in trend following we are uh, particularly in the long term it's late to get in we always see the top uh, late to get out get the bit and and we get we get the middle along the way uh, that's sort of what's happening here in the fourth quarter as, as things sort of reset that being, that being said, the currency markets are sort of in, in transition here. Uh, I guess the question is, you know, do, do recession uh, views uh, come more into play, uh, which, you know, would, would drive the Fed to, uh, you know, think about stop raising rates or even lowering rates later in the year. Uh, I, you know, I would think something like that would, uh, you know, weaken the dollar further from here. Uh, but that being said, uh, currencies are driven by interest rate differentials. Uh, if if our Fed gets, if you know, our central bank gets uh, more dovish, uh, and then in Europe, their central banks get in UK, they get more dovish. Uh, at the same time, that could strengthen the dollar again. Uh, so I, I think the currency markets here are in a, in a little bit of a. Um, a transition period on the bond on the bond side the short bond trade is held up okay it didn't give back too much too much uh so you know sort of on a wait wait and see right there what's going to happen going forward in fixed income so um so that's a little bit about what happened in the fourth quarter long story short we gave back the top we gave back the top uh, of that rug Oh, yeah, um, this is interesting. Um, I've always looked like looking at this chart. I really, this always drives home to me two two points, right? Number one is always long, the long history of um, the MLM index. I know it's created back in 1988, but the chart really shows um, the longevity of it. And then also the fact that um, to me, the managed futures has always been, it, it used to only be in, have been accessible to institutional and high net worth investors only, right? And uh, now through an index, it's really become a much more cost efficient and uh, liquid way to invest. And if you look at more on the right hand side of the screen compared to the six, I believe this is the six largest um, active managers in this space, um, it's, pretty, it holds up pretty well um, in terms of uh, performance. You really, really can't see much of a difference. So I would argue this is a pretty, the, the easiest way to get exposure to this um, asset class. Yeah, I mean, this is great. I mean, 
you know, the reason the index was created was, was to be a decent, uh, uh, a passive representation of what, what a managed future investor could get, a price-based benchmark that uh, a, man, a managed futures investor could get per, by participating in the, in the futures markets. And, you know, the one way to see, to make sure that the index is doing what it's doing is how is it doing relative to the active managers in the space? Uh, you know, is it is it explain is it properly explain, explaining the beta in the space? And uh, are you guys the ones who coined the term the alternative beta? Is that what? I'm not, I'm not sure we coined the term alternative beta, but I think this was sort of a you know back in 1988. I think this was one of, one of the early attempts uh, at trying to explain beta in in alternative uh, derivative markets. So yeah, so again, you know. This has been been around a long time. We're only twelve month returns. Uh, we've had certainly some very good times, and uh, you know, and you know, the, the are, returns are cyclical, and just like most risk premiums. Uh, and you know, as we add the manager returns in here uh, toward the, uh, on the right hand side, uh, you know, you know, there's enough managers that do things in some different ways. You're going to have dispersion, just like you would have dispersion. Uh, in active stock managers versus uh, versus the benchmark, uh, just probably a little more dispersion uh, you'd expect in, in in managed futures, but you know the return profiles certainly rhyme, uh, and and accessing it through a uh, passively uh, has has done pretty has done pretty well for you and did pretty well for you uh, uh, in this most recent period of stress. Also did. Uh, you know, very well for you here in the, you know, sort of the, this period here in 08, uh, you can see the other big one is after the I'm tech, uh, tech And then very high returns in back in the 80s when last time you sort of saw inflation. Yeah. Now, I think we've always said, right, um, we want to get into basically the second portion of this presentation, which is what we said, managed futures, great tool, I think everyone on this call also understands it's never meant to be a standalone investment, right? We've always been clear that this is meant to be a diversifier in any kind of portfolio that you currently hold. And we get a lot of questions on exactly, number one, how it, what it does. And I think we've proven that it enhances any type of portfolio that you currently have. And then the you know natural leading question then becomes how do we add a KMLM into your current portfolio? Um, in what percentage? How do we put it into portfolio? What do we take out? What do we replace? And uh, Mount Lucas recently, I guess, came out with uh, a great paper on this. I think you guys titled it Dirty Portfolio, where you look at um, adding KMLM into six so-called classic portfolios and look at the... Um, kind of effect it would have. Uh, in the interest of time, we're not going to go through all six of them. If you're interested, I think you can access the full paper on our website, kfafunds.com. Or if you're interested, you can just email us and we can send you a copy. But um, Jerry, I think, do you want to go through? Um... Sure. Uh, so, I have to give the, the dirty portfolio thing. I have to give a little credit to my to my partner who coined the phrase, uh, uh, David Aspel. Uh, you know, we were sit, we were sitting around the office, you know, the, talking about it. You know, as, as Snowy alluded to, is is you know, not looking at managed futures uh, in a standalone way, uh, and, and that you really have if if you're going to analyze uh, its a uh, its merits, you have to put it. it you know, in a portfolio, you can't you can't look at it standalone. You have to look at it how it behaves and how it it, it reacts uh, to to the overall portfolio. And, it, and as we were thinking about uh, different analogies we could use, uh, David had come up come up with the idea of of a martini. And if you add it, you know, to make a martini uh, better, uh, you uh, you add you make it dirty by adding olive juice, right? So. So that's where the so we got sort of the idea of you know hey what if we what if, what if, 
what if what if we just added managed futures to the different types of portfolios and called a dirty portfolio, uh, just like a dirty martini? Uh, you know, look, looking for a fun little hook. Uh, you know, to sort of, you know, when you've been talking about managed futures for you know twenty or thirty years, uh, it, you look for different ways to uh, entertain yourself as you're talking about it. So, so this is a. Uh, this first slide here, uh, we, we looked at the Harry Brown permanent portfolio. So Harry Brown uh, sort of developed this asset allocation uh, back in the 1980s. Uh, it was it was designed as to be a, a, and, a and I'll just uh, preface this a little bit about these six portfolios that Snowy talked about. Uh, we all sourced from uh, uh, a, a website called Lazy Portfolios ETF. Uh, you know, they got about a hundred portfolios on there. We, we chose six, um, but they're just simple asset allocations uh, that people uh, sort of set it and forget it, uh, sort of passive asset allocations that uh, invest, investors use or use as a benchmark. Um, so we grabbed kind of six, one, six of them that we thought were interesting or had been around a long time or were fairly popular. So the Harry Brown one, uh, developed in, in, in the 1980s and sort of meant, meant to work across uh, all market environments, right? So in an expansionary phase, uh, you would expect this, uh, the stocks to work. Uh, so you can see the asset allocation there for the Harry Brown. It's, 20, it's, it's equally weighted, 25% U.S. stock, 25% bonds, 25% short-term bonds, uh, and 25% gold. So Again, expansionary phase, the stock should work. Uh, in an inflationary phase, the gold should work. Uh, I did not work in 22, but that, that was the idea in the 80s behind this one. Uh, in a recession, long-term bonds should kick in and give you diversification. Uh, in a depression or a severe bear market, uh, the short-term treasury bonds uh, be the best place to hide out. So that asset allocation over year, uh, over a long period of time, it's pretty, it's a relatively low volatility uh, portfolio. Uh, you can see you can see it down here in the table, the Harry Brown. Uh, so what we did was we took those allocations, uh, ran them with some commonly used indices, to, uh, so we could get some uh, decent historical data. This one goes from Feb ninety two to uh, Sep twenty two. Uh, Compound annual return of the Harry Brown was 6.4 with a vol of around 6.3. So again, not a very volatile portfolio. This is sort of a um, set it and forget it retirement uh, type of, a, type of uh, allocation. Uh, let's see what happens when we make, the Harry, make it a dirty Harry. So pun intended there, uh, permanent portfolio. Uh, so we, Instead of having four equally weighted assets, we go to five. So managed futures gets a 20% allocation uh, using the KFA MLM index. Uh, and again, the table, right? You, you, oh, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Uh, you know, you, your compound annual return goes from 6.4 to 7.2. A drawdown is uh, taken down significantly. Again, that's, the, that's sort of the performance in those stress periods. Uh, doing doing the doing its job at the right time. Uh, volatility overall gets knocked down a little bit. Sharp ratio goes up. Uh, that's actually not the sharp. It's just the ratio of uh, return to risk. So similar to sharp. Uh, and in 2022, much better performance in, in 22. This is through Q3. Uh, the optimized result, uh, you know, we ran we ran this asset allocation or an optimizer. What did the optimizer want to give it? Uh, so this is sort of the this is the computer telling te you know we gave it twenty percent to make it equally weighted, but the computer told us uh, it would have given managed futures a fourteen percent uh, allocation. Can uh, line charts at the bottom. Uh, you know, or, orange is the dirty portfolio, is a dirty hairy. Uh, you see the drawdown chart below, like the big drawdowns in 08, 09, and then in 22, significantly reduced uh, in the dirty version. Uh, rolling ball, again, the orange line is the dirty version. Uh, you know, it sort of significantly, um, you know, reduces ball, sort of 
in, in those sort of key moments uh, in time. So the next portfolio. Uh, Actually, Jerry, yeah. if you don't mind, I'm going to stop you right here. Uh, we're running out of time and we have some great questions. I really sure. want to get you. Um, I do encourage everyone on the call to go read the paper yourself. We go through six portfolios. Um, very interesting results. Um, you can you can read for yourself. Uh, but yeah, I, I want to get you some of these questions. Um, question from Peter Flanagan. Uh, we get this quite a bit, but I, I want Jerry to to talk about this. What sets you apart from our your competitors? Sure. Well, I, I think the the main thing is that we're an index and it, it's passive, uh, so it's not it's not an active strategy. Uh, the the other sort of key components is we're pure trend, so we don't have anything else going on in there. Uh, Either, either whether it's counter trend or volatility targeting. Uh, we, in, in what sort of what volatility targeting does is as volatility increases, uh, the, you, you start reducing exposure. As volatility decreases, you start increasing exposure. Uh, we take a more, and what that also does is cuts off the, in our opinion, cuts off the right tail. Uh, it's sort of selling your winners before letting them run. Um, and it's that right tail and those winners are the things that we think have the best diversifying properties to the portfolio. So what we ultimately are doing is sacrificing the sharp ratio of our portfolio uh, for our index and our portfolio uh, so that we can maximize the sharp ratio of the client portfolio. So that's sort of, that's, that's sort of what we're doing there. Uh, you know that the and the other thing the other thing is not not including equities uh, so that we don't mu muddy the diversification benefit of the strategy. So. Great. Um, Andrew Marshall asked, "Are you invested hundred percent of the time, or do you sit in cash part of the time?" <laughs> it's, an it's an interesting question. Uh, the answer is yes to both, uh, which which sounds counterintuitive. Uh, we're invested uh, all the time, uh, but the, because of the way the futures markets work uh, and how we invest in them, uh, in order to take exposure for our fund, uh, we only need about 15% of the fund in AV uh, at the broker uh, on margin. Uh, the other, about 80, 80, 80 85%, sits in excess cash at the custodian. Uh, the margin at the broker earns interest. The, the excess cash at the uh, custodian, we invest in T-bills. So the question is, the, the real answer is yes, 100% of the time we're invested 100% in cash, but we're, all, we're also invested 100% uh, of the time uh, taking positions in the futures markets. Clearly the, clearly the positions in the futures markets is most of the risk of the fund. Interesting. Uh, Taylor Thomas asked, um, so they follow a small number of uh, managed futures on uh, daily returns. They seem very correlated with each other. So they cited KMLM and uh, Alpha Simplex on the screen. Uh, they don't now trade. Is it because they're in very similar trades? Do you know this or? Um, well, I think in a big trending year, like 22, uh, you know, when there's a lot of big moves in a lot of different places, uh, those and, and they're driven by sort of macro events as, as, as opposed to micro, you know, individual market events. Uh, yeah, I, I think, look, if, if something's going up, trend followers are long. And if something's going down, trend followers are short. It's not that complicated. Uh, mo most of the differences happens around the transitions and the edges. Uh, so I would expect in, in a year like this for managed futures to be to be very correlated. The, the, the main differences in, in uh, returns across managers are going to depend on you know what volatility uh, that manager is targeting. So if you're a 10 vol manager versus the 15 vol manager, well, the, in an up year, the 15 vol guy is going to make more. Uh, in and then the other big difference is if you're a volatility targeter or someone that is reducing exposure uh, when markets are volatile, uh, you know, that's sort of going to cap uh, the peak uh, of your returns. Uh, 
so that you, that's something that can, can create differences. And then it, the amount of markets uh, you trade uh, sometimes can make a difference, I think. Uh, but in, again, in a big macro moves like we saw this year, uh, you know, if you're trading 300 different futures or 30 different futures, uh, those, those 30 futures typically will explain the bulk of the return across the 300 futures. So there's not a, and again, in a, in a fairly macro event driven year like we've had, um, having, having fewer instruments is just fine and explains almost all of the return. Yeah. Um, I think this is in direct response to what we talked about during the presentation. Um, we said you, we, we talked, you remove the equity trends from the strategy because of redundancy, right? From a 60, 40 portfolio. Um, so someone asked, why not exclude uh, fixed income trends as well? Uh, for, well, for one, we're, you know, we're getting the long and short side of the, that fixed income. Uh, there's, I mean, there's also a, another subtle, which I guess you could, could include with stocks as well. There's, a, there's also a, a little bit of a difference with, uh, with, uh, with rates in the sense that businesses do need to hedge rates, right? Both on the long and the short side uh, in order to protect. And, and again, it, in the futures markets, that risk premium comes from the fact that businesses are sort of willing uh, losers uh, in order to hedge uh, the positions that they have. Uh, stocks are a little bit different animal uh, too, where they they are. Um, no one needs to own a stock. There there isn't really two sides of the uh, the, the stock futures market. Uh, you know, the, there isn't an always seller and an always buyer. Uh, like they're like it's not as two way as the the, the bonds FX and uh, commodity markets is. Great, yeah, it it is. I, I know you know sixty forty. I know we talk about equity bonds, but essentially they are still two very different animals, right? When we're treating them in terms of investment strategies. Sure, and again, we're in, we're in the uh, government bond market, not the not the credit markets as well. So that's a, a little bit of it. Most people that are trading bonds in their portfolio have uh, certainly have some government, but uh, you know are also doing the credit markets. Yeah. Um, someone asked, um, which I actually wasn't um, aware, but how do you explain the relative underperformance from the ETF with respect to the index? Uh, sure, that's uh, so that would be in the primarily in the cash side. So you're always, so the, 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 the fund is always gonna underperform the index by uh, the fees, which is 89, 89 BIPs uh, or management fee. Uh, I think there's plus a, a couple other acquired fund fees. Um, and then- Seeing quite uh, a substantial we, underperformance, I think, so. What's that? They're seeing quite a substantial underperformance. This person right. said- It's about, yeah, it's about, uh, Five or six percent, I believe, on the year. Uh, so, so the eighty-nine bips there, it's about fifteen bips in, in trading commissions. So, which is actually very low for a managed future strategy. Uh, the rest can be primarily explained by uh, our cash management, uh, which we had invested in uh, SEHO. Uh, it's an ETF. It's a one to three year uh, maturity government bonds. Uh, the index assumes a 30-day T-bill return. Uh, we were far, it's clearly farther out uh, on the yield curve uh, with, the, with the cash management. Uh, that in a rising rate environment that, uh, you know, in a normal year, we're going to pick up the extra.